I think you get even more excited about what I have to say now. Um, so the second part deals with uh, Germany, NATO, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, the latest and most dramatic attempt at centralization is obviously the current Ukraine war. Um, it is obviously an attempt at further and advanced globalization, centralization, imperialism, whatever you might call it, with still very uncertain outcome. And it is also the latest demonstration of global elites to show in particular to Germany, but also Western Europe in general and the EU, who is boss supported in this, of course, by elitist German collaborators and traitors. From the outset, a short general remark on war. As for violent conflicts between individuals or maybe even rival street gangs, we can normally clearly distinguish private self, the aggressor and the victim. Aggressive violence and, and defense um, the evil and uh, the guilty from the good and the innocent. But this is becoming more or less impossible, however, with interstate war and interstate violence. Because all states are aggressors. We have heard that from David Dürr before. Um, they, are, they are protection rackets that conduct their operation, whether it is offensive or defensive with means, resources, weapons, finances stolen from their own so-called protected populations. Just think of mafia gangs trying to enlarge their turf or defending uh, or protecting themselves from the attempts by another gang to take them over. Which leads me to the following first verdict and judgment regarding the current war. Everyone, Biden, Putin, Zelensky, Johnson, Scholz, Macron, von der Leyen, and so forth, indeed everyone involved and implicated in the war with means and materials not his own is an evil warmonger and they all deserve to rot in jail as accomplices to death and destruction, in addition, of course, to all the aggression that they do internally. But this does not exclude or making judgment and comparing the relative guilt and blame of the warring gangs in the present war. And here I reach a rather clear verdict. It is not Putin and his gang that aims at world domination and that has organized coups and stationed troops in Canada or Mexico so as to encircle and pose a danger to the gang ruling the United States. For that, Russia is too much of an economic lightweight. Russia is and was happy to keep control over what she had and not getting increasingly dependent on neighboring and economically increasingly far more powerful China. It is the ruling gangs of the United States in co cooperation with the European lap dogs that have and are pursuing this goal of world domination and that have said so and that have encircled Putin, Russia with regards um, which regards obviously the U.S. and the EU West as decadent and that has resisted the Western attempts at economic and cultural infiltration. And it is basically the U.S. and NATO troops that have moved closer and closer to the vicinity of Russia. The U.S. and Ukraine are separated by the Atlantic Ocean and the distance between Washington DC and Kiev is almost 8,000 kilometers. On the other hand, the Ukraine is a former member of the Soviet Union has, and has a direct border with Russia more than 2,000 kilometers long. Again, we are dealing here with gangs on all sides. Incidentally, 
these observations should also suffice to counter the implied assertion advanced by some self-declared libertarians with their rhetorical question, wouldn't you rather live in the US or, or in Germany rather than in Russia? Should not our sympathy then be with the US and Germany rather than with Russia? And should we not hope then for success of our side rather than that of Russia, whatever that success is supposed to mean under the present circumstances? Now, just a brief retort to this. It is not Putin who is taking our property and our freedom. And regardless of the ultimate outcome of the current war, it will not be Putin who will do so in the future. It is our ruling gangs that rob and enslave us, that have stepped up already now to do so, and that will almost certainly clamp down on us even more so if they win. Whereas if they would lose, that would be a major setback for our ruling gangsters and their march toward totalitarian domination of us. In any case, then, it is hardly surprising that Moscow would regard the expansion of the hostile gang ruling Washington all the way to Ukraine, that they would regard that as a threat and a provocation. Again, keep in mind, I'm talking here about rival gangs competing for turf. And Putin repeatedly said so and warned against any such attempts. Moscow demanded instead that the Ukraine stay neutral and not join NATO or the EU, which would appear eminently reasonable. After all, Switzerland is also neutral and it is the wealthiest of all European countries. Nobody has prevented Ukraine from becoming the wealthiest country in Europe. But the neocons running the show in the US were not amenable to reason. Despite Putin's warnings, they organized a coup, one of their infamous color revolutions, and helped install a pro-NATO, pro-EU, anti-Russia government gang with the current gang leader of front puppet Zelensky. And they began to arm and train its military. And they ignored or even secretly supported the military attacks of ultra-nationalist brigades in the Ukraine since 2014 on its two easternmost predominantly Russian-speaking provinces that were seeking some sort of autonomy status, especially after Russian had been outlawed as a second language in the Ukraine. Given this background, it appears absurd and devoid of any sense of proportion to declare Putin and Russia the main or even the only guilty party in the current disaster, only because he fired the first shot. Instead, the main culprit in the ruling is the ruling gang in Washington because it could have easily avoided the current slaughter and destruction by only telling their Ukrainian lapdogs, the clown Zelensky, to accept neutrality and grant some degree of autonomy to the Donbas region. As US lapdogs, they would have immediately relented, but the US did not do so. And even now, as the US, could immediately, the U.S. could immediately end the war if only they told Zelensky and his gang that the war was over and all Western support and the financial gravy team train would stop tomorrow. But no, none of that. U.S. NATO did not involve itself directly in the war. After all, Russia is an atomic power. And why risk American lives, especially after the recent Afghanistan disaster? But they imposed the most serious, drastic economic financial sanctions, boycotts, embargoes in Russia. And they froze and expropriated Russian assets in the West. And they supplied the Ukraine with weapons so as to continue and drag out the war and prevent any peace negotiation. Let the Ukraine be destroyed and Ukrainians die and be sacrificed, 
along as long as this would only lead to a weakening of Russian power. All the while claiming, of course, the moral high ground for itself. The political elites all across Europe, including even supposedly neutral countries such as Switzerland and Austria, followed the US orders to the dot, even tried to outdo each other in their eagerness to allegedly help in sending money and weapons to the Ukrainian government gang leader, while actually having thereby ever more people killed, much as can be expected of a bunch of servile lapdogs. As for Germany in particular, Germany had the closest economic ties to Russia. Russia is its main supplier of oil, gas, and other raw materials. Through various pipelines, Russia and Germany are directly physically connected. And Germany is also, and was, the leading foreign investor and producer and manufacturer in Russia. And so no one was hit harder by the sanctions and embargoes imposed by the US and the EU on Russia than Germany. Interestingly, these close German relations with Russia, in particular the German dependency on Russian oil and gas, had been based on plain economics. They were cheaper there than elsewhere. And no German party until recently had ever anything against it or post these type of relations that they had. But now, suddenly, all of this was declared a no-no, an inexcusable blunder. And, and the meanwhile retired Angela Merkel, who until only a year or so ago had been hailed almost unanimously by the ruling elite and their mainstream media as the greatest of German politicians, if not of the entire world, came suddenly under increasingly sharp attack, including from her own party leaders. Because did she not, did not the, the number of Russian pipelines during her term significantly increase? Did she not speak Russian? Did she not meet Putin many times? Did she not work for the secret police in East Germany, but maybe also for the KGB? And was it not she who, with huge support, in particular from the Greens, had closed down all atomic reactors in Germany and thus increased the German energy dependency on Russia? In any case, with the West already on the precipice, on the verge of economic disaster and depression, stagflation, due to the unparalleled monetary expansion of the Fed and the European Central Bank, and further aggravated by the economic destruction caused by the pandemic lockdown, the stock market tanked, consumer goods prices rose at an unprecedented rate, and shortages of basic goods appeared. And the German public was told by their brilliant leaders that they had to tighten their belt and prepare for some freezing during the next winter, so as to help the Zelensky gang stay warm and keep on sacrificing their own population. Moreover, the Western measures taken against Russia had some momentous geopolitical or strategic consequences. Without doubt, the measures damaged the Russian economy, but as the world's leading energy and raw material supplier, Russia was able to reorganize its trade routes, the flow of oil, gas, wheat, and so forth was simply redirected in eastern and southern direction, where there were eager buyers, China and India, for instance. After all, the world outside the West is and was much larger than the West itself. The ruble actually rose against the dollar, and, the Ger and Germany appeared to be hit much harder by the sanctions than the sanctions Russia itself. However, from the viewpoint of the US NATO neocon strategists, the economic damage produced or caused done by the sanctions all across Europe, but in particular in Germany, had also some highly welcome effects. True. The measures taken also had some negative economic repercussions in the United States. But on balance, 
the economic power of Europe and the EU, and in particular of Germany, was systematically weakened relative to the power of the United States. The European and especially German dependency on the US was increased. One had to buy now oil, gas, and so forth at much higher price from the US instead of buying it from Russia. And the massive military rearmament all throughout Europe, and again especially in Germany, that was prompted in tandem with the anti-Russian measures was to the benefit mostly of the US as the world's leading weapons manufacturer and the neocons' best friends and supporters. With this outcome, the US had accomplished an important geostrategic goal. For according to a highly influential school of geopolitical thought, ranging from Helfold Mackender at the beginning of the 20th century to Brzezinski in our own time, whoever, whatever power or powers that would attain domination of the Euro-Asian continent, the world's heartland, they called, would thereby essentially and indirectly eventually also attain domination over the rest of the world. And to prevent this from happening, and to pre preserve the Anglo-US supremacy in the world, any such powers had to be prevented from emerging. And the only danger, the only potential threat in this regard to Anglo-US, US Anglo supremacy, could possibly come from an alliance between Germany and Russia, maybe in cooperation also with France, which accordingly had to be undermined by all means. And this, indeed, had been accomplished, has been accomplished by the war in the Ukraine in its political fallout. There is no longer any danger of an alliance, of a close cooperation between Russia and Germany as it would be economically sensible and to mutual advantage. No such thing will happen in the foreseeable future. The victory for the long-standing Anglo-American alliance might also explain Boris Johnson's extra belligerence. Among the corrupt, brainwashed, and dim-witted German political elites and the mainstream media, there has been Unsurprisingly, no recognition or awareness of any of this. And if anyone mentioned or hinted it at all, he was denounced as a conspiracy theorist. Instead, so as to distract, pacify, and console the public from the economic hardship that they now must suffer, as a consequence, of course, of Germany's taking orders and following the lead of the United States, the super top gang, the political elite and the mainstream media in Germany have uh, engaged almost unison in an open hate Russia and everyone and everything connected with Russian campaign. I had of course read and heard before of similar hate campaigns here or there and historically they are nothing really new. But I had never personally experienced anything quite like this. I was shocked and disgusted about what was happening. Russian-made products were taken off, the sto off store shelves, and the Russian-named ingredients, condiments, drinks, and dishes were renamed. Restaurants refused service to Russians. Russian-owned properties were altered by neighbors and reported to the authorities for potential confiscation. Performances of Russian music and ballet uh, were cancelled, Russian literature was taken off various curricula, standing invitations to Russian athletes, artists, scholars, civic clubs and associations were revoked. The chief conductor of the Munich Philharmonic, a Russian Valery Georgiev, was dismissed because he did not rush to immediately condemn Putin, and all engagement of world-famous opera singer Anna de Netrebko were cancelled because she had once said some nice things about Putin and repeatedly shaken his hand. Now, just compare this to the public reaction in response to the wars conducted by Clinton, Bush, Obama and Biden. In any case, 
This entire Russian hysteria was the result of a scandalous, scandalously one-sided, indeed viciously devious propaganda lies spread by the German political elites and the mainstream media with the Greens now part of the German government in the lead. Having once started out as some sort of make love, not war pacifists and proponents of universal disarmament, yet carefully screened and selected by the previously mentioned various internationalist uh, elitist groups, World Economic Forum, Bilderbergers and so forth, selected by them, the green leadership had been turned around into the most belligerent, demented and delusional warmongers in Germany, not to be outdone by any other party. The most moderate party, interesting in this, um, was in the grand German uh, anti-Russian campaign, was the SPD. Um, and, and the big, biggest opposition came from the AFD alternative for Germany. Putin was presented in the media as a deranged despot, posing the greatest danger to world peace. His attack on the Ukraine in particular was supposed to be without any justification whatsoever, the expression of sheer power lust and imperialist ambitions. Rarely, if ever, was there any mention of the prehistory of the war, and to speak of U.S. NATO provocations was anathema. The Ukraine was portrayed as a completely innocent party, a virgin raped by an all-out evil Russia. There was also no mention of the fact that, whatever one might otherwise think about the war, Ukraine was neither a member of NATO nor of, e nor of the EU, and hence Russia had not started or declared war against NATO or the EU. In fact, as far as NATO and EU countries were concerned, Russia was in full compliance with all bi- and multilateral agreements and willing to fulfill all contractual obligations regarding the delivery of oil, gas, coal, and so on. To the contrary, war was essentially declared by the U.S. and its vessels against Russia, simply by virtue of their sanctions, embargoes, and their deliveries of weapons and military equipment to the, United, to the Ukraine, even disregarding the fact that they did not send any soldiers. And the economic consequences, the hardship suffered in Germany and Europe as a result of these measures then, are exclusively the fault of the West, but no word of that. Then, as far as the conduct of war itself was concerned, there has never been a war without destruction, deaths and atrocities. And it is certainly not my intention to belittle the crimes committed by Russia day after day. But, as I said, the Western media reported about them day after day after day at great, great lengths and with apparent gusto. And again, I have no intention to justify any of this. Yet, in all of their reporting, the German media always strictly followed the narrative as told by the Ukrainian government gang of Zelensky and his spin doctors. And rarely, if ever, was the veracity of the narrative scrutinized or put in doubt as is especially needed in any war. Zelensky's claim, for instance, that Russia was engaged in some sort of genocide was repeated over and over again in the Western media without any rebuke, although it was obviously false. If Russia had conducted its war against the Ukraine in the same way as the United States had conducted its war against Iraq, for instance, it could have easily bombed Kiev, Odessa and Lemberg to the ground and turned all of them into rubble, with hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties. But unlike the US and Iraq that did just that, Russia actually tried to minimize civilian non-combatant casualties and restrict its attacks to military targets. Yet these attempts were greatly vitiated, undermined 
by the Zelensky gang's military orders of taking their own civilian population hostage to be used as human shields and to withdraw and hide in civilian facilities such as schools and hospitals, for instance, so as to maximize Western outrage about Russian barbarism. As well, Zelensky's accusation of Russian genocide committed against Ukrainians is demonstrated as plain absurd, because most of the combat operations took place in the Donbas region were largely Russian is spoken and which had declared its independence and secession from Ukraine. And there, the Ukrainian army itself was busily engaged killing other Ukrainians. That is a rather strange form of genocide. All the while, the media vilified, denounced and condemned Russia and in particular Putin the same media in Germany and elsewhere in the West praised and hailed the Ukraine and Zelensky to the heavens. And that despite the fact that the very same media only a couple of years ago had presented a very different picture of them. But you can apparently always rely on the fact that most people's historical memory does not go back further than a few weeks or months. The Ukraine was now presented as a bastion of the West and of Western values. Whatever that is supposed to mean nowadays, except the adoption of gender, racism, anti-discrimination and all that stuff. While in fact, at best parts of Western Ukraine, which had long been part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire or of Poland, could be described as somewhat Westernized. Also, that the Ukraine was ranked amongst the, among the most corrupt countries in the world, on a par with Russia, or even worse, was no longer found mentioning. Nor was it found worth mentioning in the media anymore that Ukraine was an economic basket case. In fact, since Ukrainian independence some 30 years ago, its economic performance had been the worst of all former Soviet republics or satellite countries. The Ukrainian GDP per capita was only about a third of Russia's. It ranked well below that of Bulgaria, which is the poor house in the EU, and it was even surpassed by the GDP per capita of Albania. So hooray, there was another potential client for the German paymaster. And as for the professional Jewish clown Zelensky, the media presented him as a savior and a hero, an almost Jesus-like figure. He was given almost unlimited time to show off his acting skills on Western TV. All sorts of places and occasions, including the Cannes Film Festival, and he appeared with his wife even in, on Vogue. And most Western government gang, gang leaders felt obliged to set out on some sort of pilgrimage to Kiev in order to have a selfie taken with this human wonder. Johnson, Macron, Draghi, Scholz, and on and on the list went. Indeed, in the case of some of the female pilgrims, such as Ursula von der Leyen, head of the EU Commission, and Annalena Baerbock, Germany's Green Foreign Minister, I had the impression that Zelensky even served them as inspiration for some wet dreams. Yet, <laughs> yet, yet maybe that was just what the green hornish green bearbock meant by conducting a feminist foreign policy. That's what the Germans do nowadays. <laughs> now, the real Zelensky was and is something entirely different, however which was well known before the outbreak of the current violent conflagrations, but which since then seems to have been entirely forgotten, ignored or suppressed by the Western media. While elected on an anti-corruption and peace with Russia and the two autonomy-seeking Eastern provinces platform, in accordance with the Minsk agreement, which was signed by the Ukraine, Russia, Germany and France, Zelensky, up to form of a true politician, belied and betrayed his promises from the very outset. Indeed, Zelensky's entire career, 
first as an actor and then as an actor turned politician, was an exercise in corruption. His main sponsor and puppet master being multi-billionaire Ihor Kolomoisky, a fellow Jew and one of Ukraine's most influential oligarchs and greatest beneficiaries of Ukraine's rampant corruption. In 1921, by the way, the US put Kolomoisky on his list of sanctioned persons and froze his US assets. He now lives in Israel. Interestingly, Kolomoisky was also the main owner of Burisma, the Ukrainian oil holding that paid drug addict Hunter Biden, the son of sleepy, creepy Joe Biden, then US, <laughs> then US Vice President, the moderate monthly sum of $50,000 for doing nothing in particular but providing connections. As the so-called Pandora Papers discovered in 2021 revealed, Kolomoisky had paid Zelensky over the years some 40 million US dollars in support of his TV career. And once Zelensky's political career had started to take off, sums in the hundreds of millions had been funneled by Kolomoisky through various channels into various offshore accounts and invested in real estate in London, Miami, Italy as payoffs to the Zelensky clan, his brothers and their various wives. And I bet that the good man will also take a good cut now of the billions of Western financial aid currently flowing into Ukraine. Hence, once Zelensky's sacrificing of the Ukrainian people would come to an end. At least care has been taken of his and his family's comfortable retirement. Now, so much for Zelensky's anti-corruption crusade. And as for Zelensky's love of peace and freedom, the picture did not look any better. He did indeed make a brief attempt to pacify the Donbas region, but as soon as he encountered the hostile opposition of the various ultra-nationalist military or paramilitary bands, regiments, battalions, and so on, that had been assembled in the region to fight and combat the Russian-friendly secessionists, most famously among these bands were the so-called Azov Battalion, founded and funded also by Kolomoisky, that would make its last stand in the Azov-style steel factory in Mariupol, owned by another Russian, anti-Russian oligarch, um, Rinat Amatov, the wealthiest of all Ukrainian oligarchs. Indeed, Zelensky folded these ultra-nationalist groups into the regular army and associated them successively and, uh, assisted them successively in infiltrating and gradually taking over the entire Ukrainian security apparatus. As soon as the Russian invasion started then, he prohibited all men between the age of 18 and 60 to leave the country. They were thus taken hostage and condemned to fight whether they wanted to or not. This while the Ukrainian oligarchs remained free, of course, roaming around Europe in fancy cars. And all the while, Russians could still freely travel abroad and take their vacations wherever they were still welcome. I told you about it, they're all here. Um, moreover, all internal opponents and opposition forces were branded as hostile Russian collaborators and silenced through threats, imprisonment, or even assassination. Zelensky's predecessors at president, Petro Poroshenko himself, no friend of Russia, was accused of treason. All opposition parties were outlawed. All media daring to deviate from the official government narrative were closed down. And people showing any pro-Russian sympathies were publicly humiliated, maltreated, or even killed and murdered. So much for the Jesus Zelensky. Now coming slowly to a conclusion, in going on about Ukraine and Zelensky at some time, um, it has of course not been my purpose to whitewash Putin or excuse any of his crimes. As emphasized before, any interstate war is a conflict of rival criminal gangs regarding their turf. 
Rather, it was my intention to write and correct the systematic imbalance and distortion created in the Western narrative concerning the present conflict, and to demonstrate the utter depravity of the German, and not only the German ruling elites, to declare its unconditional solidarity with the ruling gang of the Ukraine, to send them as much money and weapons as it takes, money and weapons that are not its own, but that were stolen and confiscated from its own people, and that will have to be paid for by its own people through massive inflation and impoverishment, all the while they themselves kept on living high on the hog. And to send all of this loot to a foreign criminal gang that had brought the entire disaster upon itself, or rather its population, in listening to the criminal gang running U.S. NATO foreign policy. A gang that, as demonstrated over and over again, in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, and so forth and so forth, does not care one whit about the Ukrainian population and its well-being, but that has, was only interested about the expansion and extension of its own turf and that was willing to accept as many Ukrainian deaths and destruction as it takes to bring down or at least bleed and deadly weaken Russia as one of the only two major remaining stumbling blocks on their march toward ultimate world domination. Moreover, it was my intention to demonstrate how, after the cruelties committed by the ruling elites in Germany against its own population for more than two years during the artificially manufactured and fabricated so-called COVID pandemic, which was still no end in sight, that this very same gang, in a combination of cowardice and recklessness, has maneuvered Germany and with it all of Europe onto the verge of a third world war. Even if the German government gang might not have been able to prevent the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, which is doubtful, it would certainly have been able to de-escalate the current conflagration and bring them to a much quicker end. If only it had shown a little bit of backbone vis-a-vis -vis its US master, and like Orban and little Hungary, had abstained from its policy of sanctions and embargoes against Russia. As Europe's dominant economic power, and possibly in cooperation with France, this would have stopped the currently still ongoing military financial gravy train in Zelensky's direction from the EU, and all its members would have followed immediately what the pattern set by Germany and France. Zelensky and his ruling gang would likely have been quickly overthrown. Even before the outbreak of the current conflict, Zelensky's popularity had already dropped from initially more than 70%, which he got at the, when he was elected, to something like 20%. The Ukraine would have had to let its two eastern provinces go and recognize the Crimea as part of Russia and accept for itself the status of a neutral, demilitarized country. What in the world was so bad about that? And how in the world would that have hurt or damaged German interests? But no, as soon as the old and tiresome song of the incomparable German historical <coughs> guilt was intoned by the usual suspects in the US, and echoed in Poland and also in Lithuania and other Eastern territories, any and all initial hesitancy was dropped and the German political elite, along with the media, fell quickly into line and demonstrated their status as obedient, servile lapdogs. And, and the entire parade of hirelings, dupes, and knaves, fools, fakes, and fraud is led by the German Greens, whose leadership features the worst characters ever in post-World War II Germany to reach the political top. The most ignorant and the, most, the least accomplished 
And yet, at the same time, the most self-assured, fanatic, and megalomaniac people ever, and hence the most dangerous people. By people intent upon putting Germany on the course of deindustrialization and into an intellectual stone age. But a stone age, politically correct, climate, race, ethnicity, and gender neutral. A world a la John Lennon with no country, no religion, and no possession. And these creatures, the green leaders, are still considered to be the most popular politicians in Germany. Now, what can you say to all this? I, for one, can only weep. Thank you very much.